So what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna spend just 20, 25 minutes or so to overview, Scott's gonna overview two important things. He's gonna tell you uh, what his vision or his concept is of digital transformation and what he thinks that means. And then he's gonna talk about the specific digital proficiencies that he believes pools need today. Uh, and this, I think, is where I turn things to you so that you can tell us in 22 minutes or less, absolutely everything we could possibly need to know about digital transformation. And I'll start the stopwatch right now. Okay, no problem, no, uh, no challenge there. So I want to start off just defining digital transformation for a second, right? Let's just talk about that term. Uh, there are so many words that when I hear the words, like, ah, you know, everybody hears that word and they see it in a different way. Uh, digital transformation is that. Some people think it's just, hey, we're getting a lot more technology in the world. Uh, I would like to redefine a little bit the way you think about digital transformation, possibly. So think about it as a time in history. And think about it as probably about a 50-year time in history, probably from 2000 to 2050. And I think for the, the rest of humankind, when they talk about history, they'll look back and they'll say, hey, there was the digital transformation. Right? And they'll probably put it about these years, 2000 to 2050. Now, part of the reason I say that is we've seen all this before. And I want to draw an analogy for you about how important this is. You know, I, I liked Ann's comment about, hey, this may be one of the more important changes in the pooling space since pooling was founded. Uh, let me try to back that up. So if you think about uh, this wave from 2000 to 2050, uh, that's a 50 year wave. When I say we've seen this all before, let's go back to 1900. And if we kind of look from 1900 to 1950, we had a wave that was a hugely impactful wave on society as well. And that wave was the combustion engine. So we invented the combustion engine. We put it in cars and trucks, you know, uh, between 1900, 1910, you know, the Model T, uh, you know, Ford and the factory, all that kind of thing happened. What's more interesting to me is everything that happened to, to 1950. So in that 50 year time frame, we both kind of perfected the combustion engine, but then we put it to work. We built roads. We had, to, we had to build stoplights and stop signs. We had to build all kinds of new laws. Uh, we had to put in all kinds of new governance. Uh, we had to have insurance. Uh, then all of that really added to then what happened to society. In society, before this, you, if you wanted to go somewhere, it was a horse or you were walking. Uh, you know, that was it. So you didn't go very far. Uh, if you built a business, all your customers were right around you because you couldn't get customers from hundreds of miles away. In 50 years, because of the combustion engine, we completely changed where people live, how close families were or were not, how businesses could be built and do business across the entire country. We moved raw materials around in a way we never did before. I mean, the impacts from 1900 to 1950 uh, were tremendous. And most people agree that the impacts from 2000 to 2050 of the digital transformation will be even bigger. So I would like to, you to think when we say digital transformation, go, okay, well, we're in 22. So we're not even at the halfway point, right, through this digital transformation. So that's a, a way that I would like you to think about it. But I would like to go on, Anne, and, and you know, we've talked a lot about how to break this down further. Because digital transformation, that's still just a really big word, big concept. For it to be practical for all of you, for all of you to put it to work, it needs to be broken down into, into different buckets. And so uh, we need to, to get rid of some of the, let's say, complexity uh, or vagueness of a term like that. All right. Uh, and I know, Ann, uh, you, you've really thought a lot about, well, what, how could it be broken down in the best way possible? Yeah, so uh, I would say that I've thought a lot about it because of the proficiencies that you've offered, Scott, and then started to think about, okay, how do these individual proficiencies come together? So I've appreciated that we have that back and forth. You know, when you talk about that combustible engine and sort of the influence that it had on all those different pieces of society, 
um, that for me is magic when you talk about digital transformation because it changes it. I mean, it's the transformative quality, right? It's not just about one aspect. It's not just about member expectations. It's not just about market dynamics. It's not just about what our pool employees expect of us. Um, it is this period of change that's going to influence absolutely every single thing that pools do. So that for me, when you talk about, you know, how does that combustion engine change the entirety of the market? I, I see that in pools uh, in terms of that digital influence. So just this week um, we published and, and uh, hopefully you saw that we published an issue of intelligence that was authored by Scott that is introducing this concept and beginning to put some of those practical parameters that Scott mentioned in place. Um, that intelligence publication has what Scott has identified as eight proficiencies. And I know that he's gonna talk in more detail about them, but these buckets that he's referring to, as I was reading his eight proficiencies and thinking about it for pooling, I really saw four buckets to consider. The first bucket I saw was a bucket of what I'll call individual skills or individual proficiencies. And for me, that's the message that says, you know, this really starts with you. It starts with you. It starts with every pool employee. Uh, it means that the whole of your pool is only as good as its parts. And it's part of this uh, different approach that we have to take that we, we can't just throw up our hands and say, well, I'm not good with technology, right? We need to internalize it and we need to make a decision to say, uh, I'm gonna build my individual skills and I'm gonna make sure my team has the individual skills and proficiencies necessary to operate in this environment. So for me, that's the first bucket. The second bucket is one that pools are automatically really good at. It's the bucket of organizational policies and practices. And as pools, we get the value of policies. We preach the value of policies all the time. So this is making sure that you have those good digital policies in place, um, just like you have a good investment policy, just like you have good HR policies, et cetera. Uh, the third bucket that I saw in, in your proficiency, Scott, was a bucket about I guess, documentation, the documentation of those digital assets. You know, it's really hard to use something if you don't even know it exists. So looking at the ways that you document the assets that you have and that are available to you. And then the fourth bucket, the one that I think probably you're gonna talk about most today because it has the most proficiencies is using those digital resources as effectively as possible. So this is making sure not just that you have them, that you have them identified, but you're actually using them and putting them to work in your pool in a way that makes sense. It's not just implementing tech for the sake of tech, but it's implementing it for a specific purpose. Um, so Scott, I know that when we talk about these buckets, you see them through a slightly different lens, right? You've got your technologist hat on um, and you've done all the great thinking behind it about those proficiencies. So I'm gonna stand down again and let you work your magic. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's, let's look at these in a little detail. Again, as leaders, one of the things I've learned working with executives and, and just leaders in, in different levels is that uh, you've got to be able to break down this concept of transformation into pieces that you can go be make actionable. Like you can go get some things done. It, it's difficult to say we're just going to get digital transformation done. So let's look at the pieces. I just want to make some comments on these. Uh, the first one, this whole, the individual competencies uh, that you need in an organization, these are different depending on whether you're talking about leaders or you're talking about people in different departments. So not everybody has the exact same competencies. That's one thing I'd like for you to understand. If you look at it at a macro level though, I think one of the things that holds pools back the most sometimes is just missing skills. It's just, you don't have skills in an area that you, you need them to be able to take advantage of technology you already have, take advantage of opportunities that are out there. And, and I can, we can look at different spectrums. We could say, well, what's the, what's the risk if you don't have skills with cybersecurity? So if you're just missing some skills in cybersecurity, obviously the risk goes up quite a bit. From an opportunity standpoint, it's, well, if you don't have people that are really, really good at understanding how to activate data, Right, how to make data valuable for you. You might have the data, you're just not reaping the benefits out of it. Why? Because you got a skills gap. So one of the first proficiencies that's important is, hey, we gotta have the skills to be able to take advantage of what is doable right now, or just to make sure we minimize risks, okay? Uh, there's a lot we could talk about this. We'll talk a lot more about this through the year, 
Uh, but one of the things you're going to hear me say, I'm sure over and over again, is we got to do a lot better job of educating our team. Education doesn't cost that much, uh, but we think in terms of training, and we don't always do a very good job even with training. We need to move more and more to thinking about education, and especially with pools, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example, onboarding new employees. We got to do a much better job of onboarding new employees because I see a lot of pools who they'll hire good people, but they don't really invest the time to explain, here's all the technology we have, you know, uh, what, what pieces of this do we need to help you learn? And we're moving into a world more and more where pools are depending on technology at a higher level. We got to up our game with how we onboard new team members. All right, let's go on and look at the, the policies and practices. Uh, I think we've got a couple here. Uh, the first one is the commitment to digital governance. Now, there's a model that, that I have that I look at that I, over the years, put together, it's always in my mind, that has 28 elements of governance. Now, not all pools need all 28 elements of governance. You know, this is something that you got to size based on, you know, small, medium, and, and large. However, it doesn't matter if you're a small pool, you still need some level of governance. So let's say you don't need 28 elements, but you need 10 of them or 12 of them. So a, a commitment to digital governance means that leaders understand the, the importance of writing down policies and procedures that help to make good decisions when it comes to technology. Or said this way, a lot of times what governance does is it moves you on the continuum of chaos to order, right? There's always that continuum, chaos, which by the way, it's not bad, right? Some level of chaos helps with creativity and think flexibility. On the other side is order or bureaucracy. So you got to find what we call the chaotic point in a pool, you know, where there's enough chaos to, to be innovative and creative, but there's enough order, right, that we, uh, we can keep things efficient, we can keep things legal. All right. Uh, so I, I heard a great quote one time about, you know, being outside the box or being inside the box. And it was an interesting quote about sometimes the reason to be inside the box is so we don't get thrown in jail. Uh, and, and I kind of think about that a little bit when I think about digital governance is sometimes the reason we want rules and policies and procedures is just so we don't go to jail. We don't get ourselves in a lot of trouble. OK, uh, so. Again, uh, leaders have to be the ones who are looking around saying, we need a policy, a written policy or a written rule around that. Let me give you again, a great case study for pools from the last two years. What happened when we went to work from home, okay? When we went to the, the work from home model because of the pandemic, uh, it, it upped a lot of cybersecurity risk because now you had people that in some cases were trafficking in you know, what could be dangerous data if it got out on the streets, but they're doing it from home without very good security procedures in place. So a new type of governance that had to be put out by pools, uh, and if you haven't done it yet, right, just put this in the back of your mind, was a work from home security policy. Okay, and it was just something that we really didn't have before that, but boy, we needed it the last couple of years. So again, just a case study for pools of you know, this is something that it could be one page, it could be three pages, but there needed to be some type of policy. If you're going to work from home, here's the security, the new security rules that you got to follow. All right, let's go on. We've talked a little bit already about cybersecurity. It's tough to talk about digital transformation and technology without today talking about cybersecurity. Uh, this one has to be called out when we look at you know, a kind of eight different areas of transformation. And obviously, you know, the reason it's got to be called out is it is one huge risk right now. And it is probably not going to get any less risky for the next five years or so. I, I'm an optimist who believes that at some point we'll build strong enough security. This won't be as much of a problem. But right now, this is very dangerous to pools. It's, it is financially dangerous. It is, danger, is a danger to your reputation. Uh, one of the, the best ways to try to start lowering risk is to put the right types of policies and procedures in place. Uh, you know, for example, we all know that, that the most dangerous thing in cybersecurity right now is not your network security, it, it's your people, you know, what we call the human firewall. And so, you know, one of the things that, that pools are learning is that oftentimes if something bad happens to them and they go back and they look at what was the cause, 
which you have to do, oftentimes it is a team member that clicked on something they shouldn't have clicked on. Or I can tell you a, a real story from one of the pools that we work with. They had a team member that downloaded some data, put it on a server to test it, forgot to ever take it off the server, left it on the server for the last five, six years. It became an unsecured server and then it got hacked into. And no one could figure out at the pool where this data came from. And then eventually they were able to figure out that it was just somebody that was doing some test, right, a test of a system, had downloaded thousands of uh, pieces of member information and left it over here on a server, forgot about it, right? So this is the reason why you wanna have policies about how you handle data uh, to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen to you. Hey, Scott, will you, will you back up for just a minute? Will you give us just one example or maybe two quick examples of what would be a digital governance or a digital policy not related to cybersecurity? What kind, of, what kind of policies are you talking about there? What kind of governance structures are you talking about there? Sure, great, great, great topic. Uh, one of the things is how we manage uh, technology resources and projects. And so we love to have a policy in place to have a STEERCO, a steering committee, where every pool has a technology steering committee. Again, doesn't matter large, medium, small, everyone needs to have some form of a technology steering committee that has uh, multiple departments represented. And so you don't wanna just have IT making all the decisions on projects and resources. You actually want the, the business to have a lot of input on how we use our technology resources and which projects are a priority. Uh, that is a key central piece of governance in what's called decentralizing IT, which is a topic I'm sure we'll talk about is the need to decentralize IT. So that's a key one. I'll tell you another piece of governance that is hot today that I like is what's called ABO, Application Business Owner. And what it says is it, the, the policies or the procedures dictate who is responsible for pieces of software. And the whole goal is to try to get it where IT is not looked at as responsible for the software. So for example, if, you're, if your claims, right, your claims department should be responsible for their claims software. IT should not be responsible for how that software is set up or configured or, or upgraded. You know, that should be run by the head of claims. That is the ABO, the application business owner. That's another piece of governance that's pretty hot today that is trying to clear up, okay, well, who has the responsibility for software and trying to get it out of being believed that IT has all the responsibility. I think we probably just made half the people really happy and half the people really perplexed. As soon as you start talking about IT decentralization, it, it, to a lot of people, that's a new concept today. And, and so again, a great one we'll talk more about over time. Perfect. And we can talk more about it later if people want. All right, the documentation. So documentation and specifically when we talk about documentation, we wanna refer to the enterprise architecture, which is the technology word for the digital plumbing. Right, so all your technology, software, infrastructure, data, right, add that all up. You know, we call it in plain language digital plumbing. The technical term is enterprise architecture, okay? There's a real issue today with documenting uh, enterprise architecture. And the issue is we don't do it well. Uh, and when I say we, I mean IT people, all right? Uh, typically, IT folks, they have a lot of knowledge about what was built what we own, how, how it's connected, how data flows. Uh, but in a lot of cases, this is not documented well. And it's creating a lot of problems today, you know, 22 years into this transformation. Uh, we now have issues such as, you've spent a lot of money building many different applications that are all connected, but you have no documentation that shows that from a visual standpoint, no blueprints. And so it's very difficult for a new person to come in and understand, well, what is all of our technology and how does it all work together? And so uh, that's a problem. And then the other problem is just the inventory of assets. Well, what data do we have and where is it and what shape is it in? You know, what, is, what are all the pieces of software that we have licenses for today? You know, is it all secure? Do we have the right terms in all of our agreements to make sure we're protected for cybersecurity? There are so many things around the documentation of our enterprise architecture that we need to upgrade today. 
Uh, and and uh, I know that you are of the lawyer persuasion. All right. And so, and one of the things uh, that a lot of people don't think about today is just, again, the, the legal terms that are in software co contracts, and especially things you signed three, four years ago, and now you go to renew them or they automatically renew and you just keep renewing them. But the problem is they don't have uh, SLAs in them. They don't have data privacy uh, in there. They don't have uh, cyber insurance requirements, right? And, and so there's probably four or five legal terms that need to get in every software IT agreement today. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of pool leaders that they don't have a discipline of making sure this is happening, which means as soon as one of those providers gets hacked into and their members' data gets stolen, they have no ability to, to go back on that vendor. And so anyway, there... There's just a lot of things around how we properly document our enterprise architecture and our agreements, uh, work with our vendors that needs to be improved uh, just to try to help protect the pools from you know, future risks. All right, Ann was right. This last section has the most, right? It's got five, six, seven, eight. Let's talk about that. So this is how to use the, uh, the technology resources that you already have. Uh, one of the things that I've observed uh, with a lot of clients that we've worked with is uh, they're very committed to putting more and more technology in place. When we check uh, you know, a couple of years later and go around just to ask people, you know, how much of the system are you using? A lot of times I'm getting an answer of, well, I'm only using 40% of the capabilities. And so I, I have a real concern that, that we at pools, although we're committed to using technology, we're committed to automate, right? We're committed to try to do the best job we can for our members. In a lot of cases, we're not fully exploiting what all the technology could do for us. Uh, obviously that's gonna be a real problem in the last half of the digital transformation. And so let's go through four different areas of how do we get the most out of what we've already spent money on, okay? Number one, I'm going to do these in a bit of an order for you too, by the way. Number one is activating data. Let me give you the definition of activating data. Activating data doesn't mean, oh, we have data. Everyone's got data. Okay, activating data doesn't mean, oh, we can pull it into a spreadsheet and do a few things with it. All right, activating data means you can turn data as a raw material into an extremely valuable asset at the pool. And when I say valuable asset, activating data is things like, creating much more insight for you as a leader to make decisions because you're much better at doing analytics, uh, predictive analytics, data visualization, right? things like that. Uh, being able to gather more data from your members so you can build better relationships with your members. You know, These are the kinds of things we're talking about. We say, hey, we want a pool to be able to activate data in a better way. We want leaders to have more visibility. Uh, we wanna build better member relationships we even want to be able to build better relationships with our team members, right, by using data. Okay, so that's my quick thing on activating data. Again, a topic I'm sure we'll talk more about. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, enhancing the digital experiences of members. You know, I, I just mentioned with data, one of the valuable uses of data is gathering more data, more information on our members so that we can build better relationships with them. Now, I wanna make sure I'm clear about something here. When you hear me talk about humology or the importance of integrating humans and in technology, this is a great example. Uh, I know pools, a lot of the reason you've been successful is your personal relationships with your members. You know, some of you have field operations, you know, that, that they are on site with your members, helping them out. So we don't wanna lower the face-to-face -face or the human-to-human -human contacts that have made pools successful. What we want to do is amplify that by using digital means to build even better relationships so that there's a whole digital connection that's going on side by side with that human connection. And that the way that our members see it is, hey, their human connection is as good as it ever was. And now there's this digital experience that's just getting better and better that goes right alongside with it. Pick me, pick me, Scott, I got to jump in here. This is like this, for me, this one gets me every time because um, 
we have a lot of the conversations. I have a lot of conversations with pools and, you know, I, I get it and I'm 100% aligned. And what we all say is it is our personal relationships that matter. Uh, that is the nature of pooling. That's the foundation that we're based on. That's what our members expect of us. That's how we differentiate ourselves in the market, like that human relationship that we have with our members. There is no us and them. It's just all we. That is the meaningfulness. That is the, the foundation of pooling. For me, when I hear this and I hear enhanced member digital experiences and you talk about humology, the simple example I think of in my head um, it's the difference between, you know, uh, Kevin, you and I meet for the first time face to face and we get to know one another and we ask about families and we ask about work and work history and everything else. And we build this really great rapport. And then three months from now, I'm able to email you. And because we have that individual relationship or that face to face meeting relationship, our email exchange is that much easier. Uh, it's really just flipping the switch on that, right? And it's thinking about the fact that chances are pretty good Kevin and I are going to meet for the first time and for the first three, six, nine months uh, in an online environment. And I'm going to have looked him up on LinkedIn and he's going to have uh, read my bio on the website. We're going to have some email exchanges. And by the time we get to an event together and we meet one another, we're already going to know uh, about our backgrounds. We're already going to know each other. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's just sort of flipping maybe the, the timing or the nature of the start. Yeah. And let's talk about things in the middle, right? I, I like your example. I'll give you my example. Uh, Self-serve uh, technology capabilities. So, so things that a member used to call on the phone to get. Uh, and talk to a real human being that now they can just go on the website and they can get it without you. But let's talk about what's in the middle, which would be chat, right? Providing live chat capability. So, so now there's a technology component to it, but yet it's a real human on the other side of that live chat. Well, we have younger members coming up. They love to do live chat. They don't want to call. And sometimes they don't want to try to figure it all out on their own. That middle ground is live chat. That's what we're talking about, about enhancing digital experiences. All right, number seven, automation. Uh, automation has been with us for 100 years, right? This is not a new concept, but I, I will tell you this, that automation is speeding up. Uh, two reasons why it's speeding up. One, we're getting better and better tools these days, like RPA, robotic process automation, and others, you know, low-code and no-code applications, right, that are helping us to be able to automate. At the same time that happened, we had a pandemic. And when the pandemic sent people home, we started being able to see in a process everything that had to be done by hand, right? Or everything that was done manually. And so a lot of organizations said, hey, this isn't very efficient. All these things are being done by hand or manually. Let's try to automate them, which just makes it easier to move in and out of working from home. And so that got amped up the last couple of years. So it's on a faster pace right now. There is a lot to like about automation. And one thing I always have to, to say to pool leaders is, if, if I ask a pool leader, well, how much more of your pool do you think you can automate? A lot of times they'll look at me and they'll say, I don't know, what, 20, 30%, maybe 20, 30% I could automate. The truth is usually more like 40 to 50%. It's just that it's hard for them to see where they have processes where they're still doing things by hand, right? Or they're still doing things manually. So just understand there's still a big green field of things that you can automate at pools, but it takes having the right eye, the right ability to look at your processes and systems. You got to have the right access to tools. And then now we're back to number one, you got to have the skills, right? If you don't have the competencies to run the new automation applications, or you can, you know, go get those from a vendor, right? But then you don't have an ability to automate, even if you could see it. So automation has got to be clearly you know, one of the big major topics in uh, transformation. And that'll lead us to our last one. The last one is the newest, uh, the edgiest, if you want to say it that way, and that is integrating machine intelligence into the pool. And so when we say machine intelligence, yes, we're talking about AI, but we're talking about machine learning, deep learning. We're talking about smart sensors. We're talking about smart devices. And pools, they're in this world now. Whether you know it or not, there's AI getting baked into some of your software. Uh, some of you are accessing data from devices. So machine intelligence is, 
going to be a, a, a difference maker for the next five years. Uh, and pools need to have some strategy. Again, small, medium, large, it doesn't matter. A small pool has the ability to use machine intelligence just as same as a large pool would be. And so this is not size dependent. But again, we're back to this first one. If, if you don't have any skills or talents that understand machine intelligence, it's tough to apply it. 